We welcome our second panel of witnesses, Mr. Cummings, and I'll make our opening statements, then we'll recognize you for your opening statements. Our country is in an opioid crisis, and it's getting worse. Statistics can be helpful because statistics help us quantify and provide scope and scale, but statistics are what usually happen to other people. What paints the most vivid image of this crisis are those who have lost children to overdose, those who are now and will forever be in the throes of addiction, and those whose lives have been ended, upended, and are in fear of retreat back toward addiction. The increasing reality is more and more of our fellow Americans have come face to face with this crisis within their own families, to say nothing of within their own communities and the broader American family. Each year, over 64,000 Americans die from a drug overdose, and that's more than the number of Americans killed in the entirety of the Vietnam War, a war which has consumed parts of the American consciousness for over half a century. And while consensus exists on the depth of this challenge and the need to confront it in an apolitical way, the problem is worsening as more potent drugs emerge and the online market for illicit distribution expands. Our country is in desperate need of a central coordinated response. The issue knows no geographic boundary, is no respecter of state lines, which means we need a coordinated governmental response at the national level. So 30 years ago, Congress created the Office of National Drug Control Policy. This office is designed to play a central role in coordinating the nation's drug control policy and programs. National drug control efforts are spread across 16 departments and agencies implementing programs and operations throughout the U.S. So a central coordinating body is essential to ensuring effective evidence-based drug control programs. Drug control efforts should be synchronized and targeted at achieving specific strategic goals. While the ONDCP continues to receive annual appropriations from, from Congress, it nevertheless operates under an expired authorization. Reauthorizing ONDCP with revamped and enhanced authorities will improve coordination and effectiveness of federal agencies and their diverse drug control efforts. ONDCP is also tasked with administering two grant programs, HIDA and the Drug-Free Communities, ONDCP is uniquely positioned to administer these programs in a way that gives those working at the state and local level a prominent seat at the table. As Congress appropriates increasing levels of funding, the need for national coordinating office is more important than ever. And to be sure, our nation's drug crisis will not be curtailed merely by appropriating money. The money must be spent in an effective way rooted in evidence, experience, and expertise. Last week, our committee shared a discussion draft of reauthorization text for the ONDCP. The committee has held hearings, roundtable discussions to better inform our reauthorization efforts. And through the posting of our draft text online, we have received constructive feedback from the general public. Today, we want to hear from partners about the importance of reauthorizing ONDCP. By ensuring a synchronized national effort, we're better positioned to achieve our common goal of ending this devastating crisis. Um, this week is the week uh, we set aside each year in Congress to honor law enforcement. So I want to end by honoring someone in law enforcement, uh, an old narcotics officer by the name of Kevin Summers. Kevin dedicated his career to the interdiction and detection and apprehension of drug dealers. He wanted to do his part to keep his community free from the scourges of addiction and trafficking. He felt like he was doing the Lord's work. But Kevin was not just a law enforcement officer. He was also a father to a beautiful daughter named Brooke. But we know addiction is no respecter of people, not even of law enforcement officers who dedicate their lives to keeping drugs away from other people's children. No one is immune. So when Kevin's daughter, Brooke, developed an addiction, he did everything a father could do. He tried treatment. He tried unconditional love. He tried tough love. He tried treatment again. He even tried jail. You can imagine how hard it would be for a father to leave his daughter in jail. But he did so because he wanted her to be clean. He came home from work and parked his police car behind his daughter's car so he could block off 
not just her car, but also her path back to addiction. He wanted to keep his daughter from leaving in the middle of the night. He wanted to separate her. He wanted to protect her. He wanted to trap her. A father's love can be a benevolent trap. But heroin is a trap, too. So Kevin woke up one morning to the ominous sound of an empty house and the ominous sight of tire tracks through the front yard. His little girl was gone again. Six o'clock in the morning. Brooke went to a gas station. She called her sponsor. The sponsor said, call your dad. But she didn't want to disappoint her father again. So she drove to a church where she played basketball as a child, crawled into the back seat of her car, and overdosed on heroin. It's not the statistics, it's not the money, it's something you can't count. It's the grief of parents burying their child. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The first um, overdose death that I heard of, I was six years old. Six. I'm 67 now. And this young man was a hero in our neighborhood. And he, I didn't even know what drugs were. Then I had an opportunity later on in my life that the 15-year-old working in the drugstore car to watch people come in trying to get Robitussin. Remember that? Trying to get high. People that were in so much pain, they didn't even know they were in pain. Of all colors. That was 50-some years ago. And I am glad that we are moving to this moment because I do believe that this is a destiny moment where we say enough is enough. Fighting the opioid epidemic has been one of my top priorities for several years. Had a family member to die from this not only because it's the terrible thing that has destroyed so many Baltimoreans' lives, but also because it's devastating a nation. In red states, in blue states, and purple states. It is time that we finally recognize this epidemic for truly what it is a national emergency that is killing 115 Americans every single day, 115 and counting. In December, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention warned that life expectancy in the United States dropped for the second year in a row, and drug overdoses are the single biggest reason why. In 2016, Nearly 64,000 Americans died from drug overdoses. These numbers are only getting worse with every passing minute. I understand that today's hearing is supposed to be about proposals to reauthorize the Office of National Drug Control Policy. But it's hard to do that when we have, we have not been able to speak to the acting director of that office. We asked for him to testify here today, but our request was denied. It's also hard to do it when we will not be hearing from other stakeholder agencies that are involved in this fight, like the DEA and the Coast Guard. We're supposed to mark up a bill next week, but we have not received any official feedback or technical assistance from the administration. 
We had a roundtable meeting with ONDCP staffers, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that. But I'm concerned that this legislation may not be ready for prime time. Compounding this problem is the Trump administration's total lack of leadership on this issue, and they are simply missing in action. The National Drug Control Strategy was due in February, but they did not submit one. Remember what I said. We've got 115 people dying a day, but no drug control strategy. Now the president has just assumed office. I, I got that. So maybe it is understandable. But this February also came and went and he still has not submitted a strategy, 115 people dying a day. ONDCP staff told us that Kellyanne Conway is calling the shots. I sent a letter to the chairman on February 16th, 2018, asking for a briefing from her to, or anyone uh, from the White House who could tell us what's going on but that never happened. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most deadly national health crisis we have seen in three decades. In three decades. Where President Trump has shown no leadership, Congress must step into the void and demonstrate a bipartisan commitment to taking on this fight in an effective and efficient manner. We can talk all we want about how we might want to reorganize ONDCP, require new reports, and reshuffle the lines of authority. But they are not doing their jobs now. They're already failing to do what Congress required. So I have little hope that these kinds of changes alone will make a difference. Here's the main point I would like to convey today, and I would like to place it in the DNA of every cell of our brains. Reauthorizing ONDCP is an important step. We want to ensure that we have a coordinated, effective, and efficient and evidence-based strategy. But rearranging the deck chairs is not enough. Nibbling at the edges is not adequate. If someone has a gaping wound, we cannot just slap a Band-Aid on it. If someone is fatally hemorrhaging, we cannot just hand them a new organizational chart for a government office. They need expert medical care. As a nation, we need to dedicate significant and sustained new funding for treatment to combat this epidemic. The Department of Health and Human Services estimates that more than 2 million people in this country have, have opioid use disorders, which is likely an undercount. Yet, only 10% are able to access the specialty treatments they need. Imagine 10 people with cancer and you tell them that only one of you can get the treatment in the United States of America with one of the greatest health systems ever found. Something is wrong with that picture. We cannot stop this crisis if 90% of those affected cannot be treated. Last month, I introduced the CARE Act with Senator Elizabeth Warren to start treating the opioid crisis like the public health crisis it is. Our bill is modeled directly on the Ryan White Act, which Congress passed with bipartisan support in 1990 to address the AIDS crisis. It has been endorsed by more than 30 organizations, including health advocacy groups, nursing organizations, local government associations, and public health organizations. I urge all of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to join our bill. My staff has already contacted each of your offices 
and my door is open to answer any of your questions. To conclude, I want to thank our witnesses for being here today, including Ms. Goodwin from GAO, Mr. Parikh from the Bipartisan Policy Center. I look forward to hearing from Mr. Carr, an old friend and the executive director of the Washington Baltimore Haida Intensity Trafficking Area. I appreciate his effective leadership and I thank him for his endorsement of the CARE Act. Finally, I thank Commissioner Gupta of the West Virginia Bureau for Public Health for joining us today. And as I close, let me say this. This is our watch. This is our watch. And it is our duty to protect our neighbors. I think the, ch the chairman said it quite eloquently. We've got we've to do things to protect our neighbors. And it will affect all of us. There was one time that it seemed that the only place it was affected was the areas that, like the ones that I live in today and lived in for 35 years, the black community. Well, hello, that is, is a big difference now. It's everywhere. And so we have to address this in a bipartisan way, and I'm looking forward to it. And Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for, your, for working with me and um, for your indulgence. The gentleman from Maryland yields back. We're pleased to introduce our second panel of witnesses, Dr. Anand Parekh, Chief Medical Advisor of the Bipartisan Policy Center, Dr. Raul Gupta, Commissioner and State Health Officer of the Department of Health and Human Services, Bureau for Public Health, State of West Virginia, Mr. Thomas Carr, Executive Director of the Washington Baltimore High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas Program, and Ms. Greta Goodwin, Director of Homeland Security and Justice at the Government Accountability Office. We welcome all of you pursuant to committee rules. I must administer an oath, so I'd ask you to please stand and raise your right hand. Solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give should be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. May the record reflect all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. You may take your seat. Um, there's a series of lights uh, that should inform and instruct you. Just be aware that all members have your opening statement in full. So if we could summarize the salient points within the five minutes, that would allow more time for the members to ask questions. With that, Dr. Parekh, you are recognized. Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I applaud the committee's efforts over the last year to identify ways to strengthen the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy and enhance the federal response to the opioid epidemic. My testimony today is based on my perspective as a physician, a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Health at the Department of Health and Human Services, and now currently as Chief Medical Advisor at the Bipartisan Policy Center a nonprofit organization that combines the best ideas from both parties to promote health, security, and opportunity for all Americans. As the chairman and the ranking member noted, in 2016 alone, 2.1 million Americans had an opioid use disorder, and over 42,000 Americans died from overdosing on opioids. This crisis, 20 years in the making, will get worse before it gets better. Fortunately, there are evidence-based interventions and solutions that, if scaled by the combined efforts of the public and private sectors, can bend the curve of the epidemic. The Bipartisan Policy Center's Governor's Council, made up of former governors, has previously recommended four critical approaches to tackling the opioid epidemic. Number one, curbing overprescribing. In 2016, 91.8 million adults, nearly four in 10 adults in this country, used prescription opioids. As a physician, I can tell you there is no reason, neither for acute pain nor chronic pain, that this many Americans should be prescribed or be using these drugs. Number two, curbing the illicit supply, specifically heroin and synthetic opioids, which are currently driving the epidemic. Number three, facilitating treatment and recovery through increased training of healthcare professionals in medication-assisted treatment, public and private insurance coverage of these services, and increased funding to support the treatment infrastructure. We have made it far too difficult in this country to treat opioid addiction. And number four, educating America to reduce stigma and expand evidence-based harm reduction strategies, such as making naloxone more widely available. 
In order to coordinate the federal response, the Bipartisan Policy Center's Governor's Council has also recommended that ONDCP be reauthorized, adequately funded and staffed, and empowered to track all federal drug control initiatives. On that issue, I would like to make three key points to the committee today in response to the bipartisan discussion draft to codify ONDCP. First, the opioid epidemic is a multi-dimensional public policy challenge spanning public health, criminal justice, macroeconomics, international diplomacy, and homeland security. In order to comprehensively tackle the opioid epidemic, it is critical that states and communities have a federal partner that is itself coordinated. The federal response requires a leadership office, such as ONDCP, to ensure coordination and collaboration of executive branch agencies and departments that have a role in addressing the supply side and demand side of this epidemic. The committees envision National Opioid Crisis Response Plan with goals, measures, targets, action steps, and designations of responsible offices or officials is urgently needed. This plan would also more clearly inform Congress about the appropriate federal funding levels necessary to address the epidemic over the next several years. Second, the robust performance measurement and data collection activities that the committee envisions for ONDCP will require sufficient funding and staffing support. I encourage the committee to ensure ONDCP tracks both process measures and outcome measures to gauge progress in combating the epidemic. The critical drug control information and evidence plan the committee is envisioning should include assurances from ONDCP that performance metrics can be tracked using existing data surveillance systems or that systems be developed if not currently in operation. I also encourage the committee to build in some flexibility with respect, with respect to performance measurement. The committee should, should ensure agency accountability while not being overly prescriptive. And third, for ONDCP to truly succeed, it must be empowered by Congress and supported by the administration. The president should underscore ONDCP's authorities to federal agencies and departments who must be accountable for their role in implementation of the response plan. Ultimately, ONDCP needs to be the quarterback of the federal response to the opioid epidemic and needs the staffing, funding, and authority so it can lead and inspire disparate agencies and departments in tackling the opioid epidemic and other threats that may come down the road. Thank you for the opportunity to address this committee, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Gupta. Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Cummings, and distinguished committee members, thank you for the opportunity to appear in front of you today to discuss the issue of significant importance to the lives of American people, the opioid epidemic. State and territorial health agencies are on the front lines responding to the current crisis of substance misuse, addiction, and drug overdose. As a public health official and as a practicing physician for nearly 25 years, I've witnessed the consequence of this crisis in the form of overdose deaths, substance-related interaction with the criminal justice and welfare systems, HIV, hepatitis, prenatal substance exposure effects, and the burden on the healthcare system. This crisis is unweaving the very fabric of our society. In West Virginia, we continue to experience the highest rate of overdose fatalities in the nation. We are also enduring a surge in the rate of neonatal abstinence syndrome among infants, a condition in which babies are born drug dependent. Currently, one in 20 babies are diagnosed with NAS, and one in six expecting mothers are found to have intrauterine exposure to drugs. Children are being placed in foster care at a higher rate than ever before, causing a tremendous demand on the social and early childhood services. In fact, we estimate that there is an additional cost of at least $1 million for each baby born with NAS diagnosis. Our state's not alone. The number of babies born in the United States with a drug withdrawal symptom has quadrupled over the last 15 years. Under the leadership of Governor Jim Justice, West Virginia has made significant strides to take major steps in the right direction. Last year, we conducted a social autopsy of deaths and then engaged the public, a broad array of stakeholders and experts, to inform policymaking. Throughout this initiative, there was significant support for reducing the harms of overprescribing, improving access to evidence-based treatment, and increasing the use of naloxone and other harm reduction strategies. I'll be happy to share with you the findings today. Recently, as a practice internist, I saw a young woman who was brought into the clinic by her teenage daughter, being afraid of going through withdrawals and have received naloxone so many times that she was told she would not get it again. 
she was desperate to enter treatment. And I, we got her into treatment, but it wasn't easy. But for three other patients that afternoon, I tried every possible way, but the best I could do was to listen to their story, their struggles, counsel them, offering them help whenever they were ready. As I left the clinic that afternoon, I sincerely hope we would be able to help these folks before they became a statistic. Today, as we keep these real Americans in mind, I would like to stress upon three major points in my testimony. One, to develop sustainable solution to this contemporary challenge, we must have authentic national leadership that we can envision and coordinate a robust and wide-ranging cross-cutting support from multiple organizations to develop an evidence-based comprehensive response strategy. ONDCP provides this leadership. As committee explores the reauthorization, its position should be strengthened, resourced, and allowed the expertise to develop robust leadership potential. ONDCP has done more in, more recent years, in recent years more to narrow the divide between public health and public safety than any other agency. Second, Congress and states must work towards further expanding access to evidence-based treatment. We know that there are a number of barriers in accessing treatment, including stigma, homelessness, and poverty. Individuals often need ancillary services, such as housing, recovery support, employment assistance and training, childcare support, and others. Therefore, we should consider establishing a program to provide treatment and services to individuals with substance use disorders, modeled on the Ryan White program, which provides treatment for AIDS patients. With that in mind, I urge you to ensure that any change in the statute are building upon the existing system and programs that currently exist without creating an undue burden to state and local communities. And finally, we must understand that this fight has to be fought on multiple fronts. In order to fully address this epidemic, as well as substance use and misuse disorders as a whole, we must move further upstream to address the exposures during the life course that can lead to addiction such as toxic stress in infants and adverse childhood experiences. We must bolster efforts to work with schools, school-aid children, build resilient communities, and increase investments in programs that work to address social, psychological determinants of health. Inclusion, in conclusion, the opiate crisis and substance misuse will not be solved by any individual agency or state. Instead, we need a comprehensive science-driven approach. As my patient rebuilds her life, she's gonna need addressing her health, her home, her community, and the relationships with having a purpose in life. So I applaud your commitment and implore the committee to take swift action. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Carr. Chairman Gowdy, Ranking uh, Member Cummings, and Congressman, it's nice to see you back in the office again. <laughs> and distinguished members of the committees. I'm, it's an honor to appear before you today uh, to discuss the proposed transfer of the HIDA program and the revitalization of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. I come to you today as a representative of the National Hydro Directors Association, but also with a sense of deja vu, since 13 years ago to this month, I testified against a similar proposal that was before this committee. But that proposal would have transferred Hydra to the Department of Justice, and I'm glad to say it was rejected by Congress, and I urge you to do the same with this iteration. The administration's rationale for the proposed transfer is to improve coordination among drug enforcement efforts. I submit the coordination that the proposal claims to seek already exists in the HIDA program. The most significant feature of the HIDA program is a longstanding policy that each HIDA is managed by executive board. Moreover, the voting power on that executive board uh, must be, be equally divided between federal and state and local and tribal agencies. The executive board is, vitally, uh, is vital to the success of the HIDA program uh, and it has unlimited discretion over activities and ensures that each HIDA can tailor its strategy to the situation in that neighborhood. In 2017, HIDAs funded 825 initiatives. More than 22,000 personnel participated in these initiatives. As a result, the discretion afforded the executive boards, the makeup of the executive boards, and the top to bottom commitment to interagency cooperations, HIDAs have established a track record of quickly devising and implementing creative responses to the drug challenges. I said earlier I had a sense of deja vu, and I think you should know that since 2005, HIDAs have disrupted, on average, 2,882 drug trafficking organizations each year. They've dismantled 17,000 methamphetamine labs, 
taken more than 7,700 tons of drugs off the street, including 44 tons of fentanyl, heroin, and prescription drugs, seized $8.5 billion in cash, and provided training for 556,000 personnel. Now, as impressive as these statistics are, they don't tell the whole story. So let me tell you a little bit more about it. One of the things we did was we developed something called the Heroin Response Strategy. And this is the first multidisciplinary approach that I'm aware of that was focused on combating heroin and opium. The initiative brings public health and public safety partners together to reduce overdose fatalities. Common sense, if you ask me. The HRS includes 10 HIDAs and 22 states. And I think it's important to note that in a recent review of the HIDA program, the GAO demonstrates, and I quote, as demonstrated through its management of, of programs like HIDA's HRS, an agency like ONDCP is uniquely positioned to collaborate with its law enforcement and public health counterparts. GAO also we uh, recognize that a major obstacle to dealing with the opioid crisis has been the lack of shared methodology to track overdoses in real time across jurisdictions. In 2017, the Washington Baltimore HIDA developed what we call ODMAP to address this need. ODMAP tracks overdoses as one would track a disease and issues alerts to public safety and health agencies about overdose spikes. More than 650 agencies across the country are now using ODMAP to share information. So what makes this all possible? Well, we believe the discretion, balance, and independence of the executive boards is a direct result of the HIDA program being ministered by the Office of National Drug Control Policy. As you're well aware, ONDCP is charged with preparing a national drug control strategy. Key to ONDBC, ONDCP's strength is its ability to coordinate the formulation of the President's drug control budget. It needs that hammer. ONDCP's responsibilities cross the entire spectrum of drug, act enforcement, drug activities, including enforcement, treatment, and prevention. And we believe those responsibilities give ONDCP the unique perspective to accept a wide variety of approaches to the, uh, uh, to the opioid epidemic. It is more urgent today than ever before for ONDCP to be reauthorized to continue its mission. Our members and our executive boards believe that the HIDA program has been extremely efficient and effective under ONDCP, and there's no evidence that demonstrates any benefits from moving the HIDA program out of ONDCP. We think the neutrality of the HIDA program is a key is ingredient for its success, and we also know that it would be difficult for DOJ to remain neutral and objective should they become our parent agency. Further, our non-DOJ representatives and there are many, believe DOJ, DOJ cannot operate as a neutral broker as well as ONDCP. Um, the success of the DOJ is determined by how well each of its agencies fulfills the mission of the Attorney General. The success of the height is determined by how well it carries out the assignments given it to, but it, to, but it, given to it by the Executive Board. So as, as was cited before, we have 115 uh, people dying every day from this crisis. Uh, we cannot afford now to abandon ONDCP, abandon our mission, and we have to move forward. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Goodwin. Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee. I am pleased to be here today to discuss GAO's recent work on combating the opioid problem, including the role of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, ONDCP. Today, I will talk with you about two topics. First, federal agencies' opioid-related strategies and the extent to which each agency is measuring its performance. Second, federal agencies' efforts to enhance collaboration and information sharing to limit the availability of illicit opioids, the ongoing challenges to doing so, and ONDCP's role in that process. In particular, there are five strategies that ONDCP and the Department of Justice have implemented to specifically combat illicit opioids. These include ONDCP's Heroin Availability Reduction Plan, HARP, and DOJ's 360 strategy, which the Drug Enforcement Administration implements. We found that of the five strategies, only one, HARP, included outcome measures or measures that are results-oriented. The others either did not include performance measures at all or measured outputs instead of outcomes. For example, 
One of the goals in the HARP is to significantly reduce the number of heroin-involved deaths. ONDCP measures its progress towards this goal in part by using cause of death data. This is an example of a strategy with a clearly defined goal and a quantifiable measure that helps officials understand outcomes. Most importantly, an outcome measure of this kind helps the agency understand if what it is trying to achieve is actually happening. In contrast, the 360 strategy captures the number of participants attending its activities, which is an output. Measuring outputs has some utility, but it does not allow the agency to assess the impact of its efforts or whether or not the resources it is investing are yielding the intended result. We recommended that ONDCP and DOJ develop outcome-oriented performance measures for their respective strategies. ONDCP raised concerns about the recommendation, and DOJ disagreed, stating that it would be difficult to do so. We continue to believe that our recommendations are valid and that finding meaningful ways to measure the effectiveness of these approaches is essential, despite being difficult. With respect to coordination, I will touch on some of the challenges agencies are experiencing and the role we recommended for ONDCP. Federal law enforcement agencies are increasingly coordinating with the public health sector to share overdose information. However, both sectors reported ongoing data sharing obstacles and related challenges with the timeliness, accuracy, and accessibility of overdose data. For example, toxicology results can take months to obtain, and this affects the timeliness of data on overdose deaths. These data are needed to anticipate and respond to threats. Additionally, some of the data can be incomplete because medical examiners or coroners may not always test for opioids, especially synthetic opioids, thereby leading to inaccurate or incomplete data. Further, legal restrictions to protect patient privacy on how data can be shared and analyzed affect how much information law enforcement and public health officials can access and share respectively. ONDCP is uniquely positioned to collaborate with its law enforcement and public health counterparts to identify solutions to these challenges. We recommended that ONDCP lead a specific review on ways to improve the timeliness, accuracy, and accessibility of overdose data. ONDCP neither agreed nor disagreed with our recommendation, but did say it would consider it. I will note that during our review, the lack of timely, accurate, and accessible information was one of the most pervasive concerns we heard from the public health and law enforcement officials we interviewed. Given ONDCP's role in framing a national strategy, GAO believes the agency should bring together law enforcement and public health officials to improve national level data and support data improvement efforts at the state and local levels. Chairman Gowdy, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee, this concludes my remarks. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Jim. Lift from Alabama is recognized for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we talked about the, the overdose deaths, the crisis that we have there. And uh, first of all, uh, I, I think we're talking about 64,000 people possibly that died last year. I think that um, is understated. Um, uh, Dr. Perrick, uh, in your experience, would you are you seeing where the death certificate does not show death by overdose, but perhaps natural causes? I, I think you're right. I think that's probably an underestimate. Certainly, the 42,000 for opioids is likely an underestimate as well. Uh, a lot of times, the death certificates don't get into the specific cause of drug overdose deaths. Toxicology reports take a long time, uh, so unfortunately, these are likely. Uh, underestimates, and these numbers will get worse, uh, Congressman. Uh, that's what concerns me. I think uh, uh, Ranking Member Cummings made this point that uh, the CDC has lowered the life expectancy for Americans. It's not just because of drug overdoses. It's also because of suicide. Uh, for people 10 to 24 years old, uh, the second leading cause of death is suicide. And uh, to, to follow up with you, um, are we seeing suicides that are linked to uh, drug abuse? 
uh, we are, and, and these are overall called these debts of despair. So you see drugs, alcohol, suicides uh, taking a toll across uh, the country, leading to the reductions in life expectancy, as you suggested. Uh, there are a lot of factors here, economic factors as well, that, that lead to this, but they are all, all unfortunately, uh, interrelated and in driving uh, the lowering of life, life expectancy, as is you cited. Well, it ought to be shocking to people that uh, the suicide uh, issue for 10-year-olds to 24-year-olds is the second leading cause of death. And, and uh, I'm going to get into some area I probably shouldn't get into right here, but it has to do with the number of uh, children, the percentage of children that are on psychotropic drugs that have adverse effects that might lead them to other issues like opioid abuse and and um, I, I mean, in my own district, uh, we, it, it's no longer shocking to, to hear that a, a young high school student has committed suicide. We had one week period where uh, a high school that's four miles from my house had two in one week and, and another one uh, just a few miles from there. And I think when, we, when we're looking at this, this crisis, we've got to look at the totality. It's, it's just not the people are dying from overdose. It's, it's also this, uh, the suicide aspect and link it all together. I think if we did, uh, we would all uh, turn, uh, just be in shock at the total number. I mean, we've got veterans, 22 a day, committing suicide. I wonder if either uh, any of you have any information that, about that. How many of those are related to, to adverse reactions to, to drugs that cause them to have these suicidal uh, tendencies? Do you know anything about that? I think they're all, uh, I'll start, I think they're all, they can all be related, they're interrelated. I, I think, Congressman, what you're getting at is but the, the overall importance of looking at the determinants of health and taking a prevention exactly. approach. And I think the drug-free communities, for example, mm -hmm. program is trying exactly to do that with community coalitions. Uh, but, but that's what we need to do, it, prevention, 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 look at the underlying causes, the determinants of health, that's the best way to reduce all these deaths of despair, whether it's drugs, alcohol, or suicide. Well, there's there's uh, profiling can be done through to looking at DNA uh, before anyone's prescribed a drug that would give that, that would get, lay down some markers about the effectiveness of the drugs and and the propensity to 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 lead them to to other things. I think that might be part of the solution, Mr. Carr. Um, we're talking about fentanyl and. Uh, uh, one of the things that, that I've talked about with, with some of the folks in law enforcement is they, they're now deploying dogs that can sniff this out, uh, particularly uh, what's coming in the mail. A lot of this is coming from China. A lot of it's uh, produced by North Koreans. I made this comment to uh, former Governor Chris Christie that I'm, uh, we've gone from a war on drugs to a war with drugs, it seems like, and thousands of Americans are falling victim uh, one of my concerns is, and, and I don't know if, if you can answer this, is that if we're going to, to try to, to, to interdict this through the mail, what are we doing to interdict it through the mail that goes to Mexico and Central America and Canada that comes across our border? I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Congressman, that's a big problem. But one of the, big, one of the uh, biggest facilitators of drug trafficking, by virtue of the fact that they're such good shippers, is the U.S. Postal Service. Right. Uh, and I know there are efforts underway uh, that the U.S. Postal Inspection Service has to, uh, that are using uh, computers and computer, anal computer programs to uh, profile packages. Uh, we're working with them right now with our OD map project because when we detect uh, spikes in overdoses in geographic areas, then we hope to go work backwards and target the packages that did come in our coming into that particular area so we can be more effective in the interdiction. But one of the problems with the, with the way that they're shipping now is the fact that they're shotgunning. They're not sending big loads. They're sending multiple, multiple smaller loads. So it takes a lot of manpower and time to pick off those loads. And so if we got the, the old 10% uh, pick it out, I'll pick a number out of the air, if we got 10% of them, 90% of them are still getting through. It's still a problem. Could I, could I go back to one comment you made, and that's about, uh, and it was touched on about prevention. We're using the ACEs model. I think that's something that adverse childhood experiences mm -hmm. to help us pro 
profile young children. We're working with the schools in, uh, in Jefferson County, uh, West Virginia, particularly in the city of Martinsburg. The police, the school, the Board of Education, the, the counselors in the school, public health officials, all working together to identify those kids most at risk and to do something not only with them but with their parents. And that's the future of this. We have to look at long-term prevention if we're going to be successful in this. I agree 100 percent. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I just want to comment on your opening comments and, and um, um, one of the things that indicates how widespread and serious this crisis is, I don't think I know anyone who does not have a personal story of a friend or a colleague or a family member uh, similar to what you just, what you delivered. And I thank you for that and, and uh, for your indulgence, I yield back. The gentleman from Alabama yields back. The gentleman from Massachusetts recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank the witnesses for, for coming here and trying to help us grapple with this problem. Uh, just referring back to the gentleman from Alabama's comments regarding suicide, I, you know, in my district uh, a few years ago, we had a, a suicide cluster and uh, I lost uh, 14 young boys, uh, the oldest probably 17, the youngest probably 14 in a very short period. And there, there is definitely a correlation between uh, this, this opioid epidemic, not one-to-one -one correlation, but there's definitely a, a, a connection there with the desperation that comes with addiction and then these young people have no way out. And uh, the problem's bigger than that, but I think the gentleman from Alabama is, is spot on in trying to identify, drill down on that, and, uh, and deal with that. In our, our community, you know, I, I didn't know what to do. I reached out to CDC uh, and a lot of other folks. We established, I, I reached out to my construction unions. We actually built a residential facility for young people, because up to that point, we were actually co-locating kids with adults, which is a bad situation. But uh, we established the Cushing House for boys, and now we've established the Cushing House for girls. It's an adolescent residential facility uh, dealing with this problem, and uh, got the support of the Tufts Medical Center and also my local community health center and, and, and set it up. But the line is out the door. We got 40 beds, and, and I got a list probably several hundred long. Um, trying to get in. But I did want to uh, say that, you know, and I, I, I was touched by the chairman's initial remarks. Uh, and, and, you know, there's 42,000 stories out there last year alone uh, of similar situations with families losing their kids. Um, I do want to say that step one, though, is, is to have the director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy at this hearing, at that table right there. And we did not ask him to come here. And that just blows my mind because this is all about accountability. And I'm proud of Congress because the last bill that we put out has $3.5 billion to deal with this problem. And we don't have a director here who's willing to testify. We don't have a president that has a drug policy that we can articulate to, to, to families out there that are in the situations that we just described. We're dragging our feet on this and this is inexcusable. And each witness here has talked about having leadership on this issue and, and a direction and a strategy on this issue. And we have a big fat zero because President Trump has somebody there for eight months and, and uh, that didn't work out. And now we've got a new person and we won't even ask him to come here and describe what the president's policy is because we don't have one. So we got $3.5 billion to support a policy that does not exist at this point. And that is inexcusable. I got two minutes left. Let me, let me ask you, uh, Dr. Parekh and Dr. Gupta. Uh, so there's a strategy for the Suboxone. It's a replacement therapy when our kids are hooked on opioids and they're handing this stuff out like, like candy. And we're replacing opioid addiction with Suboxone addiction. It's also an opiate. And I don't see any, any improvement there. We're just substituting drugs, one drug for another drug, and we're spending a lot of money on it, and I end up with an addict in each case. Can I get your, your sense of this? Uh, thank you, Congressman. So I, I think the, the short answer is uh, 
Uh, in fact, they are different drugs. Uh, one is a full opioid, the other is a, is a partial opioid. That makes a big difference, and it allows this buprenorphine or Suboxone uh, to actually treat uh, opioid addiction. And the best evidence we have, the gold standard evidence for treatment of I'm opioid down, addiction. Okay, I'm down to 45 seconds. Yeah. And I, my follow-up is in Mr. Gupta, you could, Dr. Gupta, I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, Vivitrol, it's another version, it's a non-opioid. Non it doesn't seem to have the abuse potential that some others do. I know this, I know you come prepared for this, but, but that's my question. Is it, is it better? Or? Congressman, I, what I would say is just like diabetes or any other chronic disease, this is a chronic brain relapsing disease. We wouldn't tell somebody with diabetes, don't take insulin because otherwise you're artificially giving insulin what your body's missing, just like this. this these drugs go, they've been studied, they do four things. They prevent relapse into the system, they prevent overdoses and deaths, they reduce infectious disease risk, and lastly, they reduce the risk of somebody having uh, criminal activity. So there is documented evidence-based measures behind the use of MAT in population. The best science we have today, it seems to work. Okay. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence, and I yield back. Uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts yields back. I will tell the uh, gentleman, my friend from Massachusetts, uh, uh, the nominee was invited to the roundtable, and I am uh, disappointed that he did not come. Uh, membership participation was good, and... Um, well, I, I apologize then. No, no, no. I you did, were, not, I did not know that he was invited. He, 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 he was invited. We ought invited. to subpoena him if he didn't come. It, uh, I think it would have benefited him and us uh, to have him present, but um, he decided not to do so. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Meadows. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I thank both sides of the aisle for their heart and passion on this particular issue because it does affect every community, and yet at the same time, it, it is critically important that we recognize that uh, as important as it may be to have a new director of this uh, uh, agency slash uh, a subset of the executive branch, it is far more critical that we actually start doing something about it because this did not start with this administration uh, we've had this issue for a long time and and i know the gentleman from massachusetts would agree with that i do agree that it should be all hands on deck and i think the problem that you're you're hearing is a frustration of the fact that we have uh, a drug that is being used uh, and there's so many deaths each and every day, as Ms. Goodwin, as you pointed out, um, and, uh, that we, we've got to deal with it. Now, the other thing is, and I would encourage uh, the, the ranking member of this uh, committee has been very vocal in this area, and, and I appreciate his leadership. It also goes into other areas, like FDA. Uh, we've got to find other alternatives for pain management uh, that that are, uh, quite frankly, in the hopper waiting to be approved. Uh, and so we need to work in a bipartisan way on areas that perhaps uh, have a less addictive nature. Uh, this was supposed to be the wonder drug, and it has really uh, taken over in, in a critical area. Ms. Goodwin, I want to come to you because you talked about the coordination and where we are and that it's critical uh, that we have a coordination, and yet I think uh, what I understand is, is uh, so whether it's the DEA coordinating with the Coast Guard, coordinating with other, other areas on uh, domestic uh, uh, illegal synthetic opioids, uh, GAO found that only one of five strategies it reviewed actually included a results-oriented matrix or measurement. Is that correct? That's correct. So we looked at the five strategies that are out there, and the only one that had a performance-related metric was the HARP program. Okay, so, so if we have five programs and only one of them has a measurement, how do we know when we're succeeding or making progress? Is it all just... Well, that's something we recommended. In our recommendation we submitted to ONDCP, we talked about the need for them to come together and you know, kind of pull all of those strategies together, have a conversation, and help each of those strategies develop metrics. Because you can't really get to the heart of the problem or begin to address the problem if you don't have evidence-based information. So if it's evidence-based, I think we will find Democrats and Republicans alike that 
will want to look and say, are we making progress here? And what you're saying is, is that the only progress that we see w currently is really whether deaths go down from overdose? I mean, how do we measure whether we're making progress with any policy, no matter how great it is? What would be your recommendation? We, did, we didn't talk through or we don't put out there as GAO like what each of the entities are supposed to do. We ask that ONDCP develop a, you know, start a review to develop a strategy that cro crosses all of the different stakeholders and working very closely with the public health officials, law enforcement, and the other stakeholders, we think that's a way to come to a strategy well, and, and begin to think and about I, Yeah, let me interrupt because I've only got one minute left, but, uh, and I appreciate your answer, but I guess my question is, if you've identified it as a concern, you obviously have areas that you believe need to be measured. Do you not? Yes. So, so, so have you made those recommendations in the areas that need to be measured? Because you just said you didn't make a recommendation, but when you're doing the analysis, you, you have to run across what your areas of concern are. Yeah, one of the things we look for when we're doing our analysis, you know, when we looked at HARP, we noticed that they were actually, you know, collecting data, paying attention to the information and reporting out. Uh, the other four strategies we looked at were just measuring whether someone showed up to a meeting or participate in an activity. We didn't feel like that that went a long far enough. way, went okay. far enough to actually getting at a conversation about what's the extent of the problem, what's the nature of the problem, and how can you best develop strategies around that. So when GAO goes in to look at something, the first thing we want to know is where are the data. And we weren't finding the type of data we thought would be useful for this conversation. So Mr. Chairman, uh, may I offer this is in a bipartisan fashion, I know you have made this a priority for the, the reauthorization and really moving forward. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I know where your heart is. I know where the heart of the ranking member is on this particular issue. And if we only reauthorize to not actually have a plan that implements with a measurable tool like Ms. Goodwin did, we will have failed. And so uh, I'm, I'm committed to work in a bipartisan fashion with both of you on the leadership on this particular issue. I thank you. Thank the gentleman from North Carolina. The gentlelady from Illinois is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to let the ranking member know that I can really relate to what you were saying uh, when I was much, much, much younger than I am now, a little girl. Uh, I lost an aunt to heroin, and then um, she had three children, and her oldest daughter died of heroin overdose, dirty needle. So this is something near and dear to me. One of the most critical tools in addressing the opioid epidemic is the overdose reversal drug, naloxone. Naloxone is a generic drug. It was first approved in 1971, yet the prices of these products have increased so dramatically in recent years that state and local communities are now having trouble stocking the drug. They are being forced to ration. One of these projects, products, excuse me, an auto-injector like the EpiPen now costs 4500 for a pack of two. Dr. Gupta, as part of West Virginia's opioid response plan, all first responders are now required to carry naloxone. Is that correct? Yes, Congresswoman. And some of the first responders are from volunteer organizations. Isn't that correct? That's very true. So how does the price of naloxone affect the ability of first responders to adequately equip themselves? I think that's the important part. So one of the things that Governor Justice did, he, he actually put money behind, state money. So he's put about $10 million into the plan, with specifically $1 million, and we purchased over 37 doses of naloxone with state money. And we got them about $26 a piece. But smaller agencies do not have that capacity and ability to have the purchasing power to do that. And we're very worried uh, that uh, the price increases and the price policies that are created are going to be a stumbling block no matter how many discounts are given how many um, free naloxone is distributed. We're afraid that the average person who needs it isn't going to be able to get it because they feel it's something that's, while life-saving, is also extremely expensive in their perspective. One of my hospitals I know has a program and they give it to our law enforcement in my um, rural area of my district. We've heard similar testimony from county officials who testified at a hearing on the opioid epidemic last month in our health subcommittee one witness said because of price increases, local communities have, and I quote, fly by the seat of our pants all the time in terms of coming up with the medication. 
Dr. Gupta, from a public health perspective, how do these pricing issues affect your ability to truly combat this epidemic? I can tell you from data, when we conducted a social autopsy, we found that of the people EMS went to who have died from overdose, only a third of them actually got the naloxone. And when we talk about elderly and African American, it was even worse. So what we're seeing is that people are having, we have evidence to show that people first responders are having to decide who to give, who not to give, and then there's always an issue of stigma because folks think that maybe the elderly aren't dying because of overdose, so that adds to the problem. The CARE Act, the CARE Act which I'm co-sponsoring, would invest $500 million per year in a naloxone distribution program. Under this program, the federal government would negotiate discounted prices for the product and then distribute it excuse me, to the states, to first responders, local health officials, and the public. Would this kind of federal role in negotiating purchasing and distribution of the product help West Virginia equip your first responders and your community? Yes, from that would be critical in ability to help that person because, again, if they have to have breath in their lungs in order to be meaningfully have a chance to enter treatment, then we have to build the rest of the system as well to make sure that those folks, we save them first and then provide them the help, but this would be very helpful. And I think we'd all agree that it's unacceptable that communities all across the country are being held hostage by these arbitrary price increases, especially for a life-saving drug. And it's also unacceptable that drug companies would use the opioid crisis as a way to profiteer at the expense of all of our constituents. And I'm interested in working in a bipartisan way to see how we can combat this issue. And also, I hope my colleagues will help by co-sponsoring the CARE Act so we can bring these prices down and provide states and local communities with the tools they need to address the problem. I yield back. General Lady yields back. Dr. Desjardins. I thank the chairman and thank the panel for being here today. Uh, Ms. Goodwin, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, I've met with many groups over the years who have stressed the importance of instituting a nationwide prescription database. As you know or may know, Tennessee borders eight different states, and the congressional district I represent uh, borders two. This poses a unique problem because in the absence of a national, nationwide prescription database, drug abusers in my district will frequently get a prescription for an opioid in Tennessee and then uh, simply cross the border into Alabama or Georgia and attempt to fill another. What steps are you taking to address this uh, problem? So GAO um, has not looked into that specifically. When we did some of our review, we did talk to a number of representatives from the HIDA program. So I think actually Mr. Carr can speak more eloquently to that than, than GAO could. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Congressman. I'll try. Well, I know several years ago we were detecting people that were getting prescriptions filled for them or written for them in Kentucky and they were driving to Miami to fill them. And I don't know how many pharmacies they passed on the way, so I think you can know what they're up to. With the PDMP, uh, that's been implemented, uh, Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, I think that that's a good first step. There's some issues with PDMP in that they're all, they're all activated at the local, st the state level. So in some cases, doctors are required in that state to look at the PDMP to find out if their patient before them has in fact uh, been given a prescription for an opioid or the like by another doctor. In other states, however, it's only recommended, and they don't have to look. So I think we need to do some more work on that. I think, personally speaking, I think a na national database makes sense, especially as, as, as fluid as our, our population is today. And I would agree with you. Thank you. Uh, this is for any of the panelists uh, regarding hospice care. Under the current law, to my understanding, hospice care staff are not allowed to dispose of the patient's prescriptions when the patient passes away. This often leads to families sometimes taking uh, narcotics or opioids home with them or they may end up in their medicine cabinet and be forgot about or uh, somehow taken out of the home and, and it leads to an increase of the, the drugs being distributed back into the community. Uh, what safeguards can we enact to ensure that this problem is dealt with? Um, thank you, Congressman. Um, I, I think it's important for us to be able to have the either, again, the tra take back days as well as enhanced efforts to destroy the medications. Uh, going back to, I think we're getting to a place where opioids, um, as they are in the market, are going to have to have 
companion mechanisms uh, dispensed to patients to be able to destroy the medications. Also, blister pack. We've just enacted laws to limit the initial prescribing in ERs and outpatient. So what happens? Uh, we would like to see blister packs for three days or seven days use, and then a parallel system where they can put in a package and destroy it. So I think that technology is needed. Um, I just want to add to... Well, Nationalizing, I just want to be real careful about that because we need systems that will connect state PDMPs with other state PDMPs rather than federalizing or nationalizing because we're able to get, use our data in ways, creative ways in advance as a laboratory in states that would be a little bit difficult from uh, federalizing the PDMP. Congressman, I'll, I'll just add that, that FDA, I think Dr. Gupta is absolutely correct, FDA is looking into this blister pack idea, and I think that's very, very promising. To your point, there are 15 billion pills of opioids dispensed every year. Only 6 billion, 40 percent, are consumed. So 9 billion pills are, as you suggest, going in different places and oftentimes end up in, in families' medicine yeah, cabinets. If you can answer this for me, I've heard that of the opioid, prescription opioid-related deaths, over 90 percent of those are not the person that the drug was originally prescribed to. Is that your understanding? I, I think it's a large number. There are over 11 million Americans who are misusing opioids. So either they, weren't, they didn't have a prescription or, or they're, they're not following the prescription. So, I mean, I think that's a really important point to, to drive home is that, uh, you know, the physicians are prescribing the opioids. We're doing that at a lower rate, but the opioids are getting in the wrong hands and there needs to be uh, a focus on punishment for distributing controlled substances, and the patients need to be educated before they leave the office and probably at the pharmacy as well. And if the chairman would indulge just one last question, I recently met with a group of pharmacists that explained to me how e-prescribing can prevent over-prescribing opioids by allowing healthcare providers to see patients' medication history at the point of care, thereby helping them determine if patients are doctor shopping. Have any of you all been paying attention to this movement in states towards electronic prescribing for controlled substances? substances, and if so, have the results been positive? Uh, Congressman, I, I would say that we have attempted to do that in West Virginia. One of the challenges, I go back to this rural America divide, is that we have places we don't even have broadband in West Virginia. We have places where physicians rely on facts uh, to transmit data. So I think this links to another issue that we really have which is e-prescribing is only as good as the ability to get to our practices in sometimes very rural parts uh, of the state, and, and that's a limiting factor. But we do have some type, but it's very hard to be more robust in that. I thank the panel for their expertise. I yield back, Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. DeSonier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for this hearing, um, and I want to thank the ranking member for his passion and his urgency, and uh, I want to thank the panel members. This has been really interesting. Um, but the urgent, I guess my question is in two parts. One part is the urgency of getting this right um, and the suffering that the ranking member talked about, and all of us, I think, anecdotally have had experiences personally perhaps, but definitely professionally in this regard. I have constituents who have come to me over the years who have lost sons and daughters, uh, and, and many of them are from very diverse economic uh, aspects of my district in the Bay Area. So my question is, uh, Dr. Gupta, you really, you are in a very unique position, I think, given the challenges of West Virginia. So the urgency of getting out now, but you said at some point we have to go upstream to look at the real cause and effect. So there's stories in the book of Dreamland, which is a very compelling book that you've had a chance to read about the evolution and the causes of this. Some of it ascribed to, the, to Purdue Pharma and, and aspects of their marketing. So in that case, there's pretty good evidence that they targeted the marketing specifically to West Virginia and other areas where they knew there was a lot of manual labor. Um, <clears throat> surely it seems intuitively that they targeted <clears throat> the workers' compensation system, permanent disability. Um, so how does that make you feel when, and if you have evidence, and I know my county just joined a whole group of counties in California suing um, Purdue Farm and others because 
they have caused us to spend money, as you said, $1 million per child. So in the context of my question is, um, I'm a survivor of an incurable cancer. I have remarkable medicine that will keep me alive, uh, keep my quality of life hard, uh, high. I just had a meeting with constituents who work at the University of California who are involved in the CRISPR system there where we're lo we look like very promisingly we can use uh, genetics um, and ge to identify bacteria in our system. So I look at this system in the sustainability question of the urgency of now, but then how can we learn from this to really transform, given the context of what medical research is giving us right now, if we could take the money that we're spending on that child, multiplied towards whatever number, and put it into these programs that can avoid this thing happening in the first, in the first place, including um, private sector companies or, un, or organized crime, using the system to divert our limited resources to stop this. So you were at the front lines of this. Could you respond to that? Thank you, Congressman, very much for that question. You know, we as physicians began prescribing for pain, and we ended up over the years treating suffering instead of pain, and that's where, what we have today. Um, when we conducted our social autopsy of all the deaths in 2016 of, from overdoses in West Virginia, what we found was four out of five people actually came in contact with the health system. We were having a lot of lost opportunities that we could have helped these people. But as a result, what we found was if you're 35 to 54 years old, single, male, less than high school educated or high school and work in a blue collar industry, you have a very high risk of dying because of an opioid overdose. How we work is we're also seeing, again, a tremendous and such a demand on child welfare. We worry about the next generation as we sit here. We're losing 10, 15 years from now, those babies being born, now they're going into schools. These are the people, kids who are gonna have lifelong traumatic experiences. So as we work to address social determinants of health, as my colleagues have mentioned, we've got to look at those things. We've got to look at childhood experiences. We've got to look at traumatic communities. And we have to then work. NAS, for example, we have programs now looking at long-acting reversible contraceptives as part of the correction system. Our corrections officers know the way they're ma making the math right now, doing the math, they're saying 33 inmates uh, 33 and a half uh, correction officers equals $1 million a year in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. 37 inmates equals $1 million a year. So they're saying, we have thousands and thousands of people that need MAT. Why don't we start doing MAT instead of putting people in prison? So there's this relationship that is developing and trying to get folks to actually go through science and evidence-based treatment on one hand, saves lying, lives on the other hand, and then connecting those to treatment, and then really working upstream uh, it's really not a partisan issue for us to look at how do we help a woman actually um, get into treatment before she starts to plan a family. I mean, this is just a social responsibility because we're seeing the, outs the other side of this in society so much. We've recently had a person who, 82-year-old grand great-grandmother taking custody of a child. Those are the examples we're seeing on the ground every single day. I really appreciate that, and to um, the chair and the ranking member, I really think this is an amazing opportunity for us in Congress to change the dynamics in these reoccurring public crisis, health crises, to really look at the cause and effect, and I'm not to ascribe blame to the private sector or anybody, but to look at it evidence-based and say, not only can we solve the opioid pro program, but all of us can remember being told 20 years ago that crack babies were gonna cost us money. We've fallen this pattern of this reoccurring public health crisis that maybe we can approach it a different way and avoid these unnecessary costs and human suffering. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Uh, Dr. Gupta, first of all, I want to thank all of you for this excellent testimony. You know, one thing you didn't mention, Dr. Gupta, and I uh, was looking at a CNN piece on West Virginia, uh, with foster care. The cost of foster care because people, the parents are dead or they're on drugs. Um, can you comment on that very, very briefly? Yes, thank you, Mr. Rank Member. Uh, we have the we are not even able to now find uh, parents to foster the children. It has become so bad, can't pass. West Virginians are great giving people. When they were in the point that we have the highest levels we've ever seen in the history of the state in kids entering into foster care. It is the biggest, unquestionable, challenging burden of, of, of the future for our state, and we're very worried about that. 
Dr. Gupta, you are from West Virginia. West Virginia, your state has been hit uh, extremely hard by this epidemic. This issue does not discriminate based on politics. It affects red states, blue states, and uh, purple states. Last November, we held a hearing with Governor Chris Christie of New Jersey, who chaired the President's Opioid Commission. The commission stated that only about 10 percent of those who need treatment receive it in a warn, and he warned that people are, and I quote, losing their lives as a result of it. Dr. Gupta, is that right? And are people dying today because they simply can't access treatment? Is that true? That's absolutely correct and mm -hmm. very true. And part of the reason is stigma. It's not just they can't receive treatment. Some people worry they're going to lose their job. Some people think that they don't have enough coverage. They can't travel to get treatment. They have to in West Virginia average wait 30 to 60 days before they can enter outpatient treatment. So we have so many barriers, including stigma, why people can't get treatment and as a result end up dying. You know, I mean, we, I mean, there's a big elephant in the room, doctor, okay? Anybody who has ever been around drug addicts know that quite often uh, they end up being another person. In other words, they begin to lie, steal. Uh, one of my earliest cases as a lawyer uh, was a fellow who literally killed his hatchet, his grandmother to death, trying to get money for drugs. So they turn into another person. They look like the same person, but to somebody else. So I guess for our employer, that's a kind of difficult situation. Uh, I was just with the railroad people yesterday, and they were telling me how hard it is for them to get people to, to hire uh, because people simply cannot pass the drug test, and they worry about accidents big time, and they should. In January, your state of West Virginia issued an opioid response plan that also calls for expanded access to treatment. It states, and I quote, one of the most important actions that any state can take to address the opioid crisis is expanding access uh, to effective treatment. Is that right? Yes, sir, that's absolutely correct. One of the things we did was we had state regulations for MAT clinics. We've created exemptions for physicians so they don't have to pay the registration. They don't have to go through the whole process if they want to treat their own patients up to 30. We've also cut down on onerous regulations within our state. We're making every effort possible to make uh, MAT treatment, and MAT is just not drugs. It's a whole host of behavioral, social, cognitive therapies that go along with it as a primary focus of our effort to make sure that every West Virginian who has an opportunity wants to get into treatment has no delay, treatment on demand type of approach. And, and I, told, I gave you the 10% figure nationally uh, that are not, 10% that are able to get treatment. What, what's it like in, in, in uh, West Virginia? Do you have any idea? <clears throat> We have wait times, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, and, they, and there's a great code program in West Virginia University, and their average wait times is between 30 and 60 days. So you can imagine what happens in those 30 days, because people don't wait 30 days uh, when they have this monster on their head that they have to worry about every time getting a dose in three, six hours, sometimes even more frequent. So here's the big question. We here on the committee can talk about organizing ONDCP. We can discuss moving things around uh, on an organizational basis. We can even ask ONDCP to send us more reports. But if that's all we do, if we fail to ensure sustained funding to expand access to treatment, will we be able to turn this crisis around as a nation? And I know I'm running, I've run out of town, town, time, but I want you to also just speak very briefly. See, we, we, we spend a lot of time talking about deaths but we got a pipeline. I mean, I, I'm talking about the, 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 the living and the dead because the pipeline uh, car is far bigger than the folks, the 115 I'm talking about, are dead, dying daily. So would you comment on that, Dr. Gupta? 
Certainly, sir. Uh, one of the things I would say is that every person who has an opioid overdose, non-fatal, that comes in, it's a cry for help, basically. What they're saying is it is suicide attempt because they know every time it's Russian roulette when they inject that drug. So the question is, are we able to then connect that cry for help and get those people immediate treatment. We're working on that in West Virginia, trying to make sure that every emergency room visit, well, first of all, that doesn't happen, but if it happens, how do we connect that cry for help back to treatment? They get that treatment. There's a lot more people, it's the tip of the iceberg beneath that. So first thing is to avoid deaths. This, this, is, this is a preventable problem. This is something we can prevent and get people into treatment. Everyone that, that dies, that we see, they had four out of five people came into contact with the health system, and we failed them, to be really honest. How do you see us getting past the stigma? That's a, and that's a tough one. The stigma on the part of the, the patient, I mean, the, the drug addict. But there's another stigma, too, that we haven't talked about here. The doctor. A lot of doctors don't know how to treat this stuff. You know, they, they see a drug addict come in and say, oh, no, 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 no. They don't want to touch it. So talk about that, and how do you deal with that in West Virginia? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. The most important part of this disease, how we differentiate this from perhaps the HIV, even the epidemic, is that the stigma of this is across the communities. It's across the healthcare system, law enforcement, uh, and there's a lot of good intention, good faith folks trying to help, but that stigma continues. And it is that reason that we need to have programs like harm reduction strategies, that people will come in, be treated in a very non-judgmental manner. We have to redo the way we look at folks. We have to redo the way we treat folks, address this problem. Uh, people don't choose not to get treated. Folks have told me every five times before, we were telling them they need help. They listened. They weren't dead and not listening. It's just that they didn't filter in until the time they were ready. We have to have build a supportive system of that stigma, whether it's police officers, whether it's the treatment physicians, hospitals, criminal justice system, as well as the court system. Uh, you know, the entire society, I think we're far away from being able to do um, entirely remove stigma. We have stigma websites. We're doing everything in West Virginia and a lot of organizations are working together. But it's gonna take every, every fabric of that society to undo the stigma aspect of this, this problem. It's a big problem. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Wisconsin is recognized. Um, sure, a couple questions. I agree with you, Dr. Gupta, that I think whenever anybody takes heroin, and as I understand it, everybody who takes it knows people who's died from it, there's an element Suicide's too strong a word, but at least you're saying that it's not the end of the world if I die. And um, that's a problem. I think it was Dr. Parka who told one, one of the two of you in your original testimony, and I didn't see it in your written testimony, um, said the number of people of, in this country every year who are prescribed some sort of painkillers that could be described as opiates. Could you repeat that statistic again? Sure. So it's uh, this is the National Survey on Drug Use and Health in 2016. Uh, so 91.8 million uh, American adults, nearly four in 10, um, say they've used opioids in the preceding 12 months. Now, that could be that they were prescribed or they're misusing. A and the misusing number is 11.5. So 11.5 million Americans are misusing opioids. So either they didn't have a prescription in the first place, they got it from family, friends, or they had a prescription. Could, could you tell us the equivalent number from other countries? Uh, I, I think, uh, unfortunately, Congressman, this is a uniquely American problem. We have 5% we have of the world's population. We consume 80% of the world's opioids. Wow. So uh, that would show it's an American problem, and it shows that other countries don't seem to have this problem. So you wonder what they're doing differently. Um, have we looked into at all the background of the average heroin user. Do we ever study, you know, family background, religious background, what have you? Uh, other panelists may, may want to jump in, but I think one statistic that's important to note is, is if you look at first-time heroin users, 80% of them first started abusing prescription opioids, and I think that is a, a critical, uh, critical okay, piece. Okay, but I, I mean, do we have anything else, though, as far as, you know, demographic examples, family background, educational background, age? 
Do we have those statistics, Mr. Gupta? Uh, yes, Congressman. We, we conducted an autopsy of, a social autopsy of everyone who died in 2016 in West Virginia from overdose. What we found was typically individuals are 35 to 54 years old, male, high school educated or less, single, um, and, and, and working in blue collar industry. So this is the social autopsy. Single people, what about their parents? What do we find out about their parents? Well, I, I think uh, what we find is basically is it's uh, one of those situations of hope. It's a social. So They're not hope, but what, yeah. what was their background? What type of family background do the people have? Uh, we, we, yeah, I'm sorry. You put enough money into it. You should, next time you do a study, you should, you should check into that. Um, I, at least I felt heroin's been around this country a long time, and there was a time of stigma against taking heroin. I mean, there was a, a bright line, I think, between alcohol and marijuana or even cocaine and heroin. And I know there's been a lot of emphasis on removing the stigma. Uh, are you sure we want to remove that stigma? There used to be a stigma, and I think at the time there was a stigma unless people took heroin. But are, are you sure we want to remove that stigma? Uh, Congressman, I'll give you an example. Um, saw an 80, a 71 year old woman living with her children, her children living with her. Mm -hmm. Every time she started to use heroin for post herpetic neuralgia, that's pain after you get shingles, because mm -hmm. the doctor took it off the Percocet. And she uses three syringes. First time she injects small bolus dose, mm -hmm. second a bigger dose to make sure there's not enough fentanyl to kill her, and then she gives herself the main dose. And that's all because she actually trusts her dealer. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a lot of that because she wouldn't go and get help because she thinks her family will find out and it would be a bad thing for people to know a 71-year-old is using heroin. So there's a tremendous amount okay. of stigma. I'll give you another question. I recently had something in my district in which a member of law enforcement was very concerned. Somebody was pulled over with a substantial amount of heroin, clearly a dealer and uh, they were given time served or something. It really bothered the law enforcement person because these people are probably you know, as dangerous as can be. I know we're stuck on kind of a, a trend of saying too many people are in prison, and there may be too many people in prison, but to me, heroin and related drugs are a new thing. I am very concerned on hearing stories, and particularly more liberalish areas, of people who are dealers not really going to prison for a long period of time. And I know in other countries that don't have these problems, who are not as, oh, so afraid to put somebody away, they don't have these heroin problems either. Uh, do you think our, usually the police aren't the problem, the police want to put them away, but do you think our judges or the rest of the judicial system is getting too involved in this treatment stuff and are not sending a strong enough message to the dealers by putting them away for long periods of time since they are killing so many people? The gentleman's out of time, but you may answer his question. Congressman, I think uh, that there's a distinction to be made between dealers, which obviously are bad guys and need every, every, every year that they can be in prison for, versus the folks who are actually gotten into this and don't understand it and have something called substance use disorder or opioid use disorder that actually need help. And they can be productive. It's because the people, the majority of people we're dealing with, they're actually workers. They're working age populations. And we're losing worker productivity in this country at a rate like never before. Gentleman yields back. Uh, gentleman, I'll just point out he didn't answer my question, but okay. Gentleman yields back. My friend from Vermont is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for having this hearing, uh, and I appreciated your opening statement. And uh, our ranking member, Mr. Cummings, I also want to thank you for your incredible leadership on this, and I want to thank the panel. Um, I'm from Vermont. I'm going to take advantage of the opportunity to talk a little bit about Vermont, uh, and I'll ask a few questions, but I am going to take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, our governor uh, was the first, Governor Shumlin, to dedicate his entire state to the state in 2011 to the problem we saw emerging in Vermont of opioid uh, dependence and addiction. And I remember coming back here after the governor did that and my colleagues saying, Peter, why did the governor do that? That's bad press for Vermont. And the answer from our governor was, we acknowledge our problem and try to face it. That's what we did. 
And then a few weeks later, one colleague after another would come up to me and say, you know what, we've got a problem that's as bad or worse in my state, my district. Uh, and I think the fact that there was a focus on acknowledging the issue has helped us in Vermont establish a pretty good treatment program, the Hub and Spoke uh, program, uh, that is having some significant success. Uh, but in the past uh, year, I've been having roundtables in one community after another, uh, Brattleboro, Bennington, Newport, St. Albans, and just this question of who are the victims it's everybody who's the victim. I mean, there's some folks who work, some folks who got on it uh, because uh, they had a proclivity to uh, use excess drugs, some who started out with a work-related injury and got opioid prescriptions and it, it led to bad things and they couldn't get off it. Uh, and others who uh, are having a crisis of hope and, you know, Dr. Gupta, Gupta you're, in, you're in ground zero in, in West Virginia, uh, which I've traveled to. And there is a real crisis here of good people. And I don't, I don't meet people who are addicted that want to be addicted. You know, the dealers are a separate question and throw the book at them as far as I'm concerned, but it's a lot of good everyday citizens who would prefer to be in the workforce and aren't. And uh, this is affecting all of our communities, especially, in my view, rural America, where there is a collapse in the local economy and a lot of the local institutions that have been so important to help people have a sense of uh, purpose uh, and, and, and live those rural values of helping one another, uh, helping their community, that's all being frayed. And we've got to have as part of our response a revitalization of rural America, that's my view. But while we're trying to get there, I do believe that we must have a Marshall Plan uh, for attacking this much like we did with the HIV epidemic with the Ryan White bill. This has got no partisan uh, preference. I, every, every one of us who represents our districts have people in it who are really suffering. And the Cummings bill, which does have a Marshall Plan agenda, uh, significant resources that are applied to a, a, a dealing with this issue, that is absolutely what we need. It, this crisis is not gonna help itself. And by the way, on the stigma question, one of the biggest preventions of people making that step to go into treatment is the apprehension of how they'll be labeled. And in our roundtables, the people that were most compelling to me were two groups. One was uh, the people in recovery. And every single one of them said it was their ability to cross that line from being private and secret to being open and public, which is what made it power, empowered them to take the difficult next step. And it's what opened up the opportunity for other people in similar situations to provide mutual support, ultimately something really essential as I see it. The other group that I was really impressed with, I mean all of them really, was law enforcement. They do not like the dealers. Their job is to arrest people. But their message to us, we're not going to arrest our way out of this problem. It's not going to happen. So they saw treatment is absolutely essential. And the biggest, biggest challenge was that people who had gotten to that point where they were ready for treatment, there was no treatment available. And that's why I believe the Cummings bill is absolutely essential. That's the Marshall Plan that we need in order to give folks who are ready to make that step and rid themselves of this addiction can take it successfully. So Mr. Chairman, I'm at the end of my time and I thank the panel for listening to me. Uh, I really thank you all for your work and uh, I'm just speaking out on behalf of Vermonters. Thank you. The gentleman from Vermont yields back. The gentlelady from New York is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and all the panelists and, and Mr. Cummings for focusing on what has uh, really become a national crisis, and I'm pleased that we are jointly looking at this. Um, in, 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 in recent years, uh, pain has come to be called the, quote, the fifth vital sign, end quote. And in many uh, clinical set settings, including hospitals, patient pain levels have been measured obsessively including with the use of sad and smiley faces, and many have warned that this focus on eliminating all pain and, and getting all patients to select smiley faces spurred the extensive use of 
opioids in clinical settings. And well-intentioned policies that incorporate patient pain into quality ratings and other measurements may have aggravated the, the, uh, the problem. So I, I want to ask uh, Dr. Gupta, who probably has more experience on the level with the people with the illnesses, uh, we, we want to ensure that individuals who are experiencing ser serious pain, um, including those that are at the end of their life, uh, get the pain relief that they need. But on the other hand, it, 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 we don't want to move to the point that people are being um, inappropriately prescribed more pain pills than they really need. I mean, I've read some stories where patients were getting pain treatment and got addicted, which is a, you know, a tragedy. And apparently it's a very hard deal to get off this addiction. So one of the recommendations of the opioid response plan you just issued in West Virginia was, and I, I quote from your report, West Virginia should expand the authority of medical professional boards and public health off officials to address inappropriate prescribing of pain uh, addiction and medications. So, Dr. Gupta, what additional authorities do professional boards and public health officials need in your state to address inappropriate prescribing? And do you think that there has been any inappropriate prescribing in your overview? Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, there certainly has been. There were over 780 million pills that were shipped into uh, small towns of West Virginia. We know that uh, West Virginia had one of the highest prescribing rates for opioids, but there's good news. We've seen from 2017 data that we've ha made the most progress of any state in the nation in curbing those prescriptions. Uh, specifically... May, may I ask, of these pills that went into West Virginia, were they uh, uh, illegal drugs or were they prescribed through doctors? These were distributed prescription drugs wow. that were distri through mm -hmm. distributors that came in mm -hmm. without uh, necessarily mm -hmm. a check. Mm -hmm. uh, Governor Justice sponsored and, and passed with bi wide bipartisan support earlier this year a bill that limits the prescription mm -hmm. of opioids in ER settings to four days in outpatient settings for dentists, primary uh, uh, optometrists, and veterinarians to three days, and for mm -hmm. other physicians to seven days. So one of the things we have to do is we have to turn the tap mm -hmm. off for initial prescribing. Initial prescribing is sort of your tap to getting people mm -hmm. hooked on later on, and we know from science that beyond three to five days of prescribing is really in vulnerable mm -hmm. population leads to the disease of addiction. Whoa, um, even three to five days? That's astronomical. Now, is there anything that the federal government can do to help you in your efforts in West Virginia in this over-prescribing? I think one of the things, uh, Congressman, that can be done is as, as we move forward, we have to be cognizant about the people who have legitimate pain. So mm -hmm. as we go and we see the crackdown that happens with our state and federal partners on pain clinics, mm -hmm. illegitimate pain clinics, we've got to find folks who have genuine pain to be connected back into appropriate with physicians who do prescribe. So we want to make this where it's okay to have legitimate pain and we have prescriptions, very important piece of our treatment armamentarium until we develop those non-opioid treatments. Let me ask you, are the majority of the people that are overdosing in West Virginia taking opioids that have been prescribed, either to them or someone else, or are they taking street drugs such as the fentanyl? We found 9 out of 10 had prescription history. 49% of women filled a prescription within 30 days of their death. Yet the death we're seeing is because of street fentanyl and heroin. So what's happening is there's a crossover happening, but prescription drugs still remain a critical component of that. Okay. Do, do uh, harm reduction efforts create important opportunities to get in individuals with substance use disorders into treatment? Very important opportunities. We need to look at harm reductions such as uh, syringe exchange programs, naloxone distribution, and a host of social services that go along with that, including screening for diseases, and that as a gateway to treatment. Well, I, I want to thank you. My time has expired, and I believe this is a bipartisan issue that you can work together on for, for treatment. Thank you. Uh, the gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to our panel. Dr. Gupta, the senator from your state, uh, Joe Manchin, uh, did his own report uh, using the methodology used by the Council of Economic Advisors 
and came up with the cost of opioid crisis in your state alone of $8.7 billion. Does that sound right to you? Yes, sir. That's about 12 percent of the state's GDP. Yep. And that's, that's extreme, but there's many other states similarly placed, uh, if not exact same position. So that would suggest whatever we're investing or need to invest in treatment is a, it will have a huge return on it given that cost. Yes, sir. And obviously we're underfunding treatment right now. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know where to begin. Um, so I, I had a constituent whose son died. He was an athlete at a major university in the Northeast. He had an injury. He was prescribed opioids and he developed an addiction. He was a motivated young man and did everything in his power to try to kick it. He went into rehab, he went into treatment facilities. The treatment was wrong and ultimately led him to need the high. He moved to heroin and he died of an overdose. Tragic, tragic story. Is, I'll ask either one of you, Dr. Parekh or Dr. Gupta, are treatment facilities regulated for this crisis, for this problem? I think treatment facilities are regulated at the state level. I think that the, the issue, uh, Congressman, is that not enough treatment facilities are offering the gold standard, which is medication assisted. Well, well, let me go back to certification, though. Can I put out a shingle and say, we've got the expertise here to deal with your opioid crisis, give us a call? Uh, un unfortunately, that, that, that is being done um, right now. Uh, That's right. That is my point. It's not regulated, not uniformly. And so treatment, uh, the idea of going for treatment, well, what treatment? For example, the example I gave of my constituent's son, um, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong medically, but one of the treatment centers he went to uh, uh, embraced the AA model go cold turkey and follow the 10 steps or 12 steps. Well, it turns out, according to my constituent, that is exactly the wrong thing to do. You cannot simply go cold turkey with this addiction. It's different than alcohol. And if you don't have some intervening treatment, you put yourself at enormous risk. And the, and the craving for that high will absolutely move you to something else, heroin or fentanyl, for example, leading to worse outcomes. I see you shaking your head, Dr. Gupta. Is that accurate? Yes, Congressman. Um, ha only half of the private treatment facilities across this country actually offered MAT, and in that, only a third actually get MAT. MAT is the best science-based treatment available, yet we struggle across states with, um, there are gonna be small sliver of population that maybe the 12th step works for them. But uh, there, there often seems to be prohibition for using yep. any mind-altering well, drugs. I, I'm running out of time, forgive my interruption, but my constituent argued it's actually life-threatening. It was life-threatening to his son to go that route, even with the best of intentions. Uh, Congressman, I'll add one more quick thing. People who have opioid use disorder, having other mental conditions is the rule, not the exception. Yeah. So you have to be treating other underlying medical conditions and if organization does not accept that, treatment for bipolar so, depression, then you're in trouble. So, Ms. Goodwin, in the time I have left, the President's own Council of Economic Advisors estimates the cost of this crisis to the U.S. economy, we talked about West Virginia, is a half a trillion a year, correct? Correct. So certainly, the President has proposed a national strategy to deal with this. Has he not? Yes. yes. He has? And what is that strategy? So that strategy is kind of in the making. Um, oh, in the making. Yes. Has the President declared this a national emergency as was recommended to him? Yes, it has been declared a national emergency. And what flows from that? So that, the, the declaration of an emergency will mean that the different federal agencies will start to think through and think about how they will address the crisis. You may already know that GAO has ongoing work 
looking at uh, public health declaration around this crisis. That's in the beginning stages, so we are in the process of designing the scope and methodology for that. My time is up. Um, I, th I do think, I, I want to thank the Chair for having this hearing, and I, I, there is no way we can move forward without this being on a, on a bipartisan basis. This is a crisis that affects every community, every socioeconomic strata. This is not something limited to one group or another, uh, and it's, uh, it's reached crisis proportions, obviously, in the United States. So we've got to work together to find solutions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Virginia yields back. Um, I'm going to go last, so I want to th uh, start by thanking um, the panelists for your expertise, your commitment to uh, helping us uh, combat this issue. Dr. Gupta, the, what progress, if any, is being made in the ability to objectively diagnose pain, as opposed to allowing the patient to pick which frowny face or on a scale of 1 to 10, which is inherently subjective, is there any progress being made in being able to objectively diagnose pain? Um, Mr. Chairman, I think there, there is some work in the research and development sort of phase of this. It's been a difficult thing from a clinical aspect to be able to diagnose something that's very subjective. I do think efforts need to happen there from an R&D standpoint in order to get more objective signage, but clearly um, there's a need for that. Okay, so if I were to present myself at either of the doctors, I assume you all are medical doctors or, or are you PhDs? Medical doctors. I present myself, I tell you I have pain. Um, you are not totally reliant upon me to quantify that, but it helps. There's no test you could administer. What are the alternatives to habituating uh, prescriptions? What, what are your pharmacological alternatives to something that is habituating right now? First of all, we would want to make sure, do the proper testing to find out if there's a legitimate physical reason for it. But then again, opioids are just one part of it. They're not very good pain treatment to begin with. There's other options, including non-pharmaceutical options, as well as pharmaceutical options. So we're talking about back pain, for example, very common. Most of the back pain treats itself in about a couple of weeks. So oftentimes you need supportive treatments, not really opioids. That's something that opioids would traditionally use. Combination of medications like acetaminophen and ibuprofen, that really means Tylenol and Motrin put together, tends to have in some studies better outcomes or better impact on pain than does opioids. Okay. You put your finger on something. I present to one of your uh, physician practices. I tell you I'm in pain. I want something that I consider to be strong. You're recommending something I can get at CVS or Walgreens. So I got a couple of options. I can either go see another doctor and hope for a better result. Um, so you, you've got, you know, in July we were told, and look, I like doctors. I grew up in the house with one. Um, I'm not, uh, I don't get excited talking about prosecuting physicians. But, but the reality is there are licit drugs that are handled in an improper way. And, and there's money to be made doing that. So is this a misinformation issue? I mean, you just... You just said there are better alternatives to opiates. I assume doctors know that. So if there are better alternatives, is it a lack of, of information that, that allows them to prescribe it, or is it the, the, the money aspect? Uh, Mr. Chairman, there's a whole host of issues. As I was practice, in my practice since 2000 or so, I've been told uh, by the industry that these are medications that are very highly effective, there was no potential for addiction, and all kinds of things. If short-term doesn't work, we have long-acting medications. They're really sold and marketed as the ultimate solution, and now we know that that's not the case. All right, so, but you don't get to be a medical doctor by not being bright. So the fact that some pharmaceutical rep comes in gives you a calendar and a keychain and says, hey, look, you really need to prescribe this medicine even though I made straight C's in college. Take my word for it. Is a doctor really going to be persuaded by a pharmaceutical rep? If you look at direct-to-consumer advertising campaign and the pharmaceutical budgets, companies' budgets that go into this type of work, it, at least the evidence demonstrates that that strategy tends to have some impact on the prescribing habits. Um, 
this will probably be over my head, but we'll try it anyway. Um, from a, what is the pharmacology of opiates that makes it so difficult to, you know, last week they told us nicotine was the toughest drug to beat. In a previous life, I dealt with heroin addicts. I, I, I would list that as the toughest drug to get off of. What is it about the pharmacology that makes it so difficult? Mr. Chairman, it's the same pharmacology would be for heroin, which is it goes and crosses your blood-brain barrier and attaches to the receptors, the particular receptors that gives you a pleasure to begin with, and as well as a number of other activities. And that's the reason when people have framing, craving, the need for increasing the dose continues, people go to the cheaper, uh, readily available street alternative. That is the same action receptors that we work with MAT, whether they block them, they are partial agonists to them, or they are pure agonists to act it. But the, ultimately, the idea here is to work on the same receptors that opioids have sort of stayed on in terms of heroin or prescriptions, and almost cause a person to become um, addicted to that and have the disease of addiction. Now we prescriptively do that with drugs like buprenorphine and others to to block those or actually partially work with those receptors. So it's the same mechanism. It's just we, those, the drugs that we talk about, MAT, are, are not something that people are going to be able to get high on or overdose from in the doses that they're prescribed, but they can if they also use some of the other drugs along with it, the street drugs. All right, I'm out of time, and I want to hold myself to the same standard I hold my colleagues to, so I'm going to give myself one more question after running out of time like I do them. Uh, I was just in your beautiful state uh, two weeks ago. It's a beautiful, beautiful place to be. Um, are you satisfied with DEA's diversion, not, not DEA agents that wear guns and badges, I mean the diversion, the folks who actually monitor pharmacists and physician practices, are you satisfied with the presence of DEA diversion in West Virginia? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. West Virginia is a great state. We are very thankful for DEA folks helping us with diversion. One of the things that can definitely happen, we in West Virginia have a requirement for licensees like myself to have a mandatory training for opioid prescribing. That is perhaps something I also hold a DEA license. That's something that perhaps needs to be nationalized where it's important for every physician, every person going to medical school, nursing school, any, anywhere they're going to be close to opioids, be able to have a particular curriculum-based training as a part of their practice. That's something of an outstanding piece, but we're very appreciative of DEA's partnership with us. All right. I want to thank the members for their participation. I especially want to thank our witnesses for your expertise, for your um, comedy with, uh, with a T, with each other, and with the uh, members, and um, look forward to visiting with you again. The hearing record will remain open for two weeks for any member to submit written opening statements or questions for the record. If there's no further business, uh, the committee stands adjourned.